Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of I Never Knew Inc., but my dog did by Life Coach Maureen. I am Maureen Scanlon. I am an author, speaker, podcast host, and hopefully something extraordinaire. I am so excited, as I always am, for every guest because every guest brings something so new and so amazing, and I feel so blessed every day I wake up that I get to do this. And today's guest is no exception. It's so neat to see the different people that come into my existence and my awareness. And I, I just, oh, I, I love, I love my life. I love that I get to do this. So guys, wait till you hear about my next guest, Donald Gregory James. He is amazing. And his resume is absolutely off the charts. And there's so much to him. Um, both, you know, intellectually, intellectually, um, but also I feel spirit from him. And I feel this connection that I was just telling him off air, no matter how, how many of my logistical thinkers and my logical thinkers come to me, we always end up with this human connection. So let me get started with what Donald James is all about. So he is retired from the American Space Agency. Yes, you heard that right, the American Space Agency. He mentors several students and early career professionals and gives talks to hundreds of students each year. He has provided workshops to organizations around the themes of his book, and I love this so much. Manners will take you where brains and money won't. He enjoys traveling, reading, and physical exercise. He's been married for 33 years. That's his biggest accomplishment in my eyes, and has two grown children. So he began his 35-year NASA career at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland as a presidential management intern. Love it. To our intern listeners out there, you see, you can get your start, get your foot in that door, and you can become a Donald James. So he has also received his BA at the University of Southern California in internal relations. He also attended Cambridge University and Harvard's Senior Executive Fellows Program. He is a recipient of numerous awards and citations for exemplary service. And he is my neighbor from Arizona. He is in California. So welcome. Welcome, welcome, Thank Donald. You. Thank you. It's such an honor to to, to be talking to you and and uh, lifting everybody up on a great topic. Yes, so yes, it's the privilege is all mine. And guys, it's so cute. He's got a shirt on and right above the pocket, it says manners. And I love that. <laughs> my, I... my wife got that for me as a present for when the book got published. And so I wasn't sure should I wear my manner shirt or my NASA shirt. I kind of go back and forth. So, you know, you can imagine <laughs> both ways. <laughs> right, right. Either one is a conversation starter, I think. I, th I think the manners one is more of a conversation starter. Yeah. So as you know, this podcast is about our stories. It's about, I, I feel in the mental health awareness world that I've entered in, I'm in my fifth year of service in life coaching and relationship expert. I, I feel like What's really neat about this is bringing our stories because they're so much more impactful than lecturing people. So yeah. we're going to start with your story. Tell us about young Donald James. Tell us where your struggles were. What was your upbringing like? Yes. Um, in spite of uh, what I would say is a fantastic upbringing, I had a mother and a father who cared about me and my brother deeply, even though my parents split when I was seven years old, I never felt like I came from a broken home in that sense. Uh, my mother was a teacher. My father was a lawyer turned foreign service officer. And so we were reared around people who really believed in education, the importance of that. And in spite of all that, I mean, I did okay in school, but I have to confess, Maureen, that I wasn't a straight A student. I didn't get perfect SAT scores. Um, I probably had more fun than I should have. Um, so I, 
I, I say that as a pretext is saying that if you go to the other end of my professional career where I was a high ranking senior official at NASA, people who look at my background and ought to ask this question, but how is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> You're not an engineer. You're not a scientist. Well, I kind of consider myself a social scientist. I got a master's degree in economics. And I loved how you talked about my bachelor's degree. You said internal relations. I'm like, I like that better than international relations. I think internal relations is really that important. I think I'm going to. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that and use that. So thank you. See, Maureen's already coaching me. She's doing oh great. Oh my gosh! I actually, I, I, I by making a mistake, I just completely changed four years of your hard work. You know, sorry about no. that, but I love it. Maybe it's a Freudian slip. It's it's a great one because the fact of the matter is, internal relations are relationships with ourselves and relationships with other people. I have found in my career are very, very important. And so my story is one in which my brother and I grew up wanting to be pilots. We wanted to fly planes. We lived near an airport. We saw planes all the time. And then because my dad was in the foreign service, we traveled all over the world and we were always on airplanes. And what happened was, is that my brother made it to be a pilot and I didn't. And I talk about the reasons why in this story is that I had kind of an epiphany during my college years that what it took to be a pilot was not something I was willing to do, whereas my brother was willing to do that. That's why now he is a captain with American Airlines, and I'm a retired NASA official. Uh -huh. But there's, uh, uh, but my brother and I both share the conviction of the manners. The title of the book is what my mother used to always tell us, that it doesn't matter how smart you are, how rich you are and all that. If you want to have a meaningful and fulfilling life or success, depending on how you define success, how you show up in the world and how you show up to the world is so vitally important. And so I wrote this book. Uh, I, call, I started writing it after I had given a talk and I tell this story. Uh, to a group of NASA interns. I'd already retired. They asked me to come back and talk about your career to NASA students. And one student at the end of the question and answer session said, well, if I could go back in time to when I was an intern, and I was an intern, you mentioned that, I was a presidential management intern, 20 something. I said, knowing what I know now, what would you advise your younger self? And I said to the young man, I said, you know, I would tell younger Donald, that heed the advice from your mother, my mother, that manners will take you where brains and money won't. And I have to tell you, um, I, that's really true. I think when I finally dawned on me midway through my career that, um, you know, you have to you have to know how to do your job, right? You have to know how to do your work. NASA is never going to hire you because you have good manners, right? There, I, I didn't say to the interviewers when I was at Goddard, was, why should we hire you? Well, I've got great manners. <laughs> They're going to laugh me out of the room. You know, I knew how to do the work. But the key to being successful and to navigating through an often challenging world is not necessarily going to be through how intelligent and, and you're uh, smart you are. And it's certainly not going to be how much money you have. And my, my, the argument for my thesis is as follows. I know that there are many very, very smart people who are incarcerated. They happen to be criminals. Bernie Madoff was not stupid. Right. He was a criminal. I also happen to know that there are a lot of very wealthy people, you probably coach some of them, who aren't happy. Why is that? They have all the money in the world and they can go anywhere they want and all that, but there's something missing. There's a hole in their heart. There's, there's, there's a disconnect with their, their spirit and their soul and the universal energy that surrounds us. And so why is that? And so the case that I want to make is that if you want to – work in an organization, let's say like NASA or anything else you want to do in life, I would highly recommend that you remember that being smart is just not good enough. And so my mother unexpectedly died about two months after I gave that talk. And I decided that in her honor, I would focus on this topic because 
I give lots of talks to students all the time. In fact, this week I'm talking to thousands of students around the world through an organization. And they all want to know the same thing. Well, what do you have to do to be successful? You know, do you have to take math? You have to take science? You have to do this? You have to do that? And I say, in order to be successful, in my opinion, cultivate the skill of your manners. And when I talk about manners, I'm not just talking about the please and thank you stuff. That's important. That's etiquette. I'm not even talking about, you know, do you hold the door open for somebody or not? I'm talking about the complete package, your energy, your physical presence, your speaking, your listening, your thinking, all of that is a part of and shapes your manner. Presence, authentic presence is so critical. So that's, so, so I went from, you know, a middle-class guy who had, you know, all the opportunities in the world Probably didn't do as well in school as I wish I did. I mean, I was a B student, B plus. And when I got to graduate school, I really found my way and I just crushed everything. But the fact of the matter is, there are a lot of NASA people that I met who were straight A students, went to Harvard, and Ivy League schools and got perfect stat scores. <laughs> yeah. And there were also NASA people who were like that, who lost their jobs or didn't get a promotion. And why was that? When I looked at some of the cases that I was familiar with, I say it's because of their manner. Now, you're never going to see on their termination sheet, well, we're going to get rid of so-and-so because he has bad manner. That's not what they say. No. You know, they'll say something like, you know, we, we need to reassign that person because it's a better fit for what we need to do. Well, that's code word and bureaucracy for you got fired. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Um, or we're going a different direction. That's we're going a, a different direction. That's another code <laughs> word. Yeah, we have to go in a different direction and we really see you better. That's the diplomatic way of doing it. And that's probably okay. But if I dissect the behaviors that I noticed and saw, even among our astronauts, you know, uh, I, that's that's what I noticed. Now it's not all the time; it's actually few and far between. Yeah. But this is what I this is where I landed with the arc of my career, the things I learned from my mother, and the extensive reading and study that I have done. That this is what I have to give to young people, to early career professionals, and anyone concerned about how they are engaged in life. You know, why aren't you getting that date? Why aren't you getting invited to the prom? How come so-and-so got a promotion and you didn't? All of these kinds of questions. My recommendation is take a look at your manner to see if you have anything to do with that. Because it might, it just very well might. So that's, yeah. that's my story. I I love all of it. And I'm going to unpack all of it because that's what Maureen does is she doesn't let anything go without, you know, breaking it down. First of all, I wrote down and you'll see me look away and write a little bit. I wrote down something you said, cultivate the skills of your manners, which is really neat because people don't think it's a skill, but yeah. it is. And the other thing I heard is my mind went to you're respected for your knowledge, but you're admired for your manners. And to me, yes. manners, AKA people skills, influence. Yes. Think of the people in the world that we remember that are either here or gone. We don't remember them just for their knowledge. In fact, that's such a small part of what we remember them for. We think of yeah. mother Teresa and her character. We think yeah. of, um, people that are very, you know, very intelligent, um, Steve jobs, you know, very yes. intelligent, but he also had compassion for employees. Yeah. He also suffered loss. I mean, he lost his own company, you know, from yes. out from under him and he recouped. Yes. I think you're, you are on point with what success looks like because that legacy a that your mother left that you're carrying on i love legacies and i'm all about that with my my Thank children you. and i think i tell people all the time donald you know this at my funeral when you get up at that podium you're not going to talk about my degrees that's you're gonna, right you're going to talk about how i made you feel you're going to talk about a moment when you were down and hey maureen hugged me and, and just made me feel good or hey you know donald sat with me when i was at my lowest moment and i think we lose that and we talked about before we got on it's a lost art the art of connection right yes absolutely and and it happens it can be subtle. It can be sometimes it's almost imperceptible, but there's, there's an, there's a sense of the connection that 
leaves an impression, right? And so that's why in one in one part of the book, I have a whole chapter on interviewing because I figured for my main audience, most of them are interviewing at some point. But I invite people to look at interviewing much broader than that which they do for a specific job or promotion. And I invite them to think that as they walk in the world, they are always interviewing. There are people who I would hire tomorrow because I met them and I was so impressed with them on many fronts that I would say, wow, if I was a hiring manager, I had a job, I'd hire that person. And usually it has nothing to do with their technical skills. I can teach you the technical skills you need to do the act the, what's in the job description, but I can't teach you integrity. I can't teach you a pres presence very easily. Uh, and there's other characteristics as well. And so um, you're always interviewing and, and, and people notice you, people pay attention and say, wow, I like that person. I'm not even sure why, but I, I want that person on my team. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it's real, it's real important to cultivate the skill. And I think you can do it and you can do it by practicing certain things, but it begins with a mindset shift that um, you have to be willing to take on. I, I call it pink suits. That's chapter four in my book. I call it pink suits. Like try on a pink suit, right? Most of us don't walk around wearing pink suits. I have nothing against pink suits. And a lot of people wear them and they look really good. And I've got some pink clothes in my attire. But I never had an all pink suit. So the point is, it's a metaphor for doing something that's a little different than what you're used to doing. You like to try it on and dabble. You mentioned Steve Jobs. There's a great story of how Steve Jobs got inspired by developing a new kind of font for Apple because he took a calligraphy class. And there was a story about how he ended up with the calligraphy class. It was totally different than computers and technology, but it made a world of difference and it totally transformed Apple, right? Because yes. he took a pink, his pink suit was taking a calligraphy class, right? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's about being brave and doing something different. We don't want to go through life. We're not here for, you know, hopefully 80 to 100 years to do the same thing. That's yeah. sort of that insanity cycle, right? Do the same That's thing, right. expect different results. So, what yeah. what I've noticed, Donald, and, and I think because you've been in such an intellectual environment, what I have noticed is people who a are wealthy or um, highly intelligent um, that have no manners that that will say are rude. Um, and I'm not getting political here, but the Donald Trump um, mentality is they act a certain way and people go, that's okay. That's just how they are They're but they're really yeah. smart or they're really yeah. wealthy. And, and yeah. I think we've excused rudeness and we've yes. said hey just it, it's okay that's just who they are or there's people internally like you said they're not in touch with themselves and say you right. know what this is how i've always been people know me instead yeah. of saying let me try something different what do you think right. about that is that something common that you've seen i i do see that because people often ask me the question it says well you know, I know people like the former president and Elon Musk and even people like Kanye West. I mean, they they have a manner that offends a lot of people. But look at them. They're rich and they're wealthy. Right. And so where, where I go with that is I said, um, well, I view manners as a virtue. Uh, there is a moral component to it. Yes. And just because someone has figured out a way to um, get noticed or to make a lot of money, I question whether it means it's actually right or correct. Um, uh, I, I remember um, watching one of the first SpaceX launches and the SpaceX control room is in Hawthorne, California. And one of the things that stood out to me was the gross lack of diversity. I, I think I counted one female out of 25 people who were sitting in the control room no people of color and i remember thinking i said you know we've got to do better than this i mean because this is what people see on the tv the thousands and so people don't see themselves in there they wonder well this is still the same kind of dynamic going on well i had an opportunity to bring this up to um someone who was the head of the um uh, i think it was a might have been um 
I wasn't sure it was the National Science. I think it was the National Science Foundation. Anyway, she was a very prominent, a former NASA person, scientist in her own right. And I brought this up at a meeting that we had, and I said I told her about my concerns about this office, and she said, "Well, why don't you tell him?" And I said, well, "I don't, I don't have his phone number." And well, I'm going to see him next week at a conference, and I'm bringing it up. And I'm like, "Oh no, what did I do?" <laughs> <laughs> Open that can of worms, yay! Well, open that can of worms, but you know, in hindsight, I thought, why not? You know, why not plant a seed and say, look, I know you've got a lot of capable people from different stripes. You know, why don't you put them in the control center so the world can see what kind of company you actually are? To me, that's a manners thing. That's paying attention to this kind of thing. And so I I feel that um, we can have judgments about people who are have having a large bank account in my book is not a prime indicator of one's success or one's ability to have a positive influence on the world. There's a sense of humility that comes with it. I think there are a lot of people who have horrible bank accounts who probably have a better impact on life than the others. Right. You know, so, so I, I don't, um, I don't disparage people who make a lot of money. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a capitalist at heart. I believe people ought to have the freedom to try to do what they want to do to make a living. But I still think, you know, for every, for every Musk and, and former president and others, you know, then you've got Jeffrey Epstein's. And I ask you, you know, he had a lot of money, but do you really want to go there? I mean, um, so I, I, I just don't think it's, um, if your goal is to just be rich no matter what, and if that's really authentic, okay, great, do it. But I question, you know, for what purpose? You know, who are you lifting up? What are you trying to influence and change? Are you just trying to influence your bank account? As Denzel Washington famously said, no U-Haul is going to follow you to your cemetery when you they bury you. It's ah, not. Yes. <laughs> Oh. No one's gonna, no one's gonna put in your grave all your money and your things. But and if they did, it would rot just like you do. So, I, I question, you know, the accumulation of wealth just for its own sake. Just to say, wow, I, you know, I, I, I got rich. That's really great. Well, why? <laughs> yes, that's. It, it reminds me. I was the lead in a play in high school called "You Can't Take It With You," and that was yeah. Uh, you yeah, remember that right. one? Yes. And, and that's what came to mind was you can't that's take right. it with you. But what you can cannot. what can you take with you? What you take with you are the lessons that you learned here, and then also what you're leaving for those that that are still here that that you've left. I agree with you when I when I coach people, especially business coaching, when when my clients come and they're like, I have this idea and I have no idea where to go. And I go, I don't care about the how I don't care about, you know, the business aspect, we're going to first drill down. um, Something that's called the it's the Japan or Japanese psychology. Let me let me like like get my tongue back in, in control here. It is a Japanese psychology or psychological thought process about the meaning of life and it's called Ikigai and it's really about first tell me your why tell me your why and then tell me your who who are you serving right and then the how and the where and the all that come into play and it's so amazing just like you growing up, I I didn't have a lot of the opportunities I would have loved to have. And I, you know, made, this is why I started this because I never knew back then the talent that I had until I learned to be my own best friend and love myself. So, you know, 45 years of making the same mistakes over and over. And then when I finally believed in me, and I heard a a little clip about from Tom on the radio yesterday, where Tom Petty said, I can't compete with Andre Bocelli when it comes to music, he said, but my music has believability. Yes. And, and that hit me yesterday when I heard that. I was driving. And I it love was like, that. Right? It was, it was on one that. of these oldie channels where they have this competition where you have to name who that artist is. And they, that's uh-huh. what he said, a little sound bite. And it made me think. When I finally believed in my self-worth, when I finally believed in myself, the the gifts that I had finally came to light. 
Yes. And that's where the wealth and the knowledge, okay, they're all there in you. But first of all, we have to figure out who are we? What am I, what am I bringing to the world? Yes. You, you won't know that until you've loved yourself unconditionally and said, oh, so my gift, why I life coach, why I do a podcast, why I write books was connecting. I, yeah. I do this. I find a thread of something in every human I encounter that we have in common. That's wonderful. And what a gift that is for the rest of us to be able to see the benefit and to experience the benefit of your synthesis of this so that we can understand and trust, you know, you're a trustworthy person that when you see the twine that binds us and illuminate that twine that binds us, we all get to say, wow, I'm not alone in this. You know, this is really great. I, I mentor many students. Uh, and one of the things that I usually tell them earlier on is at some point, you need to find your voice and i can't tell you what your voice is that's something, something you have to figure out but when you do find it you're going to be like the happiest bird in the world you're going to be willing to sing and chirp and do as much as you can because you're comfortable in that and that you know that was true for me and I'm sure it, what I'm hearing from you is that that was true for you is that you found your voice and you found you found your purpose and you were able to share that with others. And I suspect that you're like me, that one of the things that I enjoy so much is being in the space of those who are transforming their lives for the better, yes. uh, because it's a continual transformation for me. There's, a, there's another interesting Japanese concept called bosatsu. And Bosatsu is about, I cannot become enlightened until I enable others to be enlightened. And that's the work that you're in. You're enabling other people to be enlightened, to find their voice, to love themselves, to figure out, I have a reason to be on this planet and I am going to make a contribution. And that's all I'm going to give because when I go, there's nothing left of me except for the wake that I have left behind. And so I, I commend you for the work you're doing. That's great. Oh, thank you. I think the getting is in the giving. And, you know, it, it's just when you, you, my mother has always said, when you love what you do, you'll never work a day, another day in your life. And when I retired from corporate and, and did my life coaching full time, because I was doing both of them, yeah. um, I man, my younger self would have said, stop wasting time. Like get the lesson sooner. Will you like stop, you know, stop doing this, this same thing. So I, I love God. I just love talking to you. And I think, you know, we're, we're so like-minded and when you're like-minded with people, you just attract more of it. And mm -hmm. I think everyone has these little nuggets that we, we get from each other and it doesn't matter how old you are. Cause people think, ah, well, you know, I'm too old for that now. Nah, you're never too old to stop learning. Tell me what you think is your biggest, biggest success, whether it was career or whether it was just internal, your, your confidence level or your spiritualist, um, mindset. Uh, my children. Yes. Oh. My children. I have two wonderful children. They'll be 30 and 27 in January. And in spite of me, in spite of their mother <laughs> and, in, and because of me and because of their mother they um you know I, I i and i apologize if i get emotional because uh, my children are very precious to me rearing children is a lot like launching a rocket all rockets use 80 to 90 percent of their thrust and energy in the first eight minutes of liftoff so all of it is at the very beginning the purpose of the rocket is typically to deliver a payload into orbit. You have to go a certain speed and you have to be at a certain altitude in order for that payload, whether it's a satellite or whether it's um, an astronaut crew capsule to stay in orbit. And so all of our work and energy and rearing children happens at the beginning, right? The first 
day through the time they go off to college, which in the grand scheme of things, is like the first eight minutes. Some rockets blow up and they never get off the launch pads because it's dangerous. It's tricky. It's challenging, just like child rearing. I'm blessed because we were able to deliver our two little payloads into orbit and they stayed there. They haven't come crashing back down to earth. And at some point, they will develop the capability to fire their own thrusters and then leave Earth orbit and go into the universe to chase their stars, wherever that is. I'm not afraid about whether my children are going to make it or not. I'm not concerned about whether they're going to come crashing back down to Earth. If they do, we will be here and they have a home. They know that, you know, this office will be reconfigured to be a bedroom again. But the fact of the matter is, when I watch my children in action, and I've had the privilege of doing that, I can see that some of what I talked about and what my mother, their grandmother, talks about have paid off. You know, my ch- if you give my children something, Marine, you will get a handwritten thank you note thanking you for that gift. You will get that. Um they know how to comport themselves in their interaction with people. And as such, you know, my children have landed great jobs, they're being promoted. You know, my daughter is, you know, looking, probably gonna get another promotion because the CEO recognized that she's not only talented at what she does, she's got good manners. So that's, to me, more important than anything are my two children. Everything else that I've done this details. Wow. Oh, oh, we got, we got, you know, space references there. We got dad vibes. I just all, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. And I feel absolutely the same way because that is what continues on. And, you know, I, I always think about what we're carrying on that payload that each generation is carrying also from the past. And yes, yes. are they learning from us? And I have adult children as well. I have a 32, a 30 and a 24 year old. And now I'm now taking in my 14 year old grandson. And wow. Um, what's interesting is every rocket is completely different. I did have a crasher. Yes. I, I have a rocket that crashes often and I've had to, um, maybe displace that <laughs> rocket and I've separated for, uh, both of our mental health, I think. Yeah. So what a, what a neat analogy you use there. And I agree with you. It's so important because what's, what's interesting is so and we can influence this in others. So if someone yeah. has, if someone does, this is one thing I've recognized. Some people don't even know they're not, they don't have manners or they don't know they're doing certain right. things. My husband is an engineer and whew, he was rough around the edges. <laughs> and uh, as I said, I, I tell him all the time, you were as flexible as a steel bar. <laughs> and the way now that we're raising um, my my grandson, because I was divorced um, yeah. before I met him, and he's now uh. the be- he's the best human on the planet, but his, he was not soft. And so we've learned together, I've learned to be a little bit tougher. He's learned to be softer in the way that he says it. And I think a part of manners is delivery. You know, my yes. husband always had this thing when I would correct him, uh, he, he would be condescending at times, go figure. Uh, and I would just correct him and say, you know, that that doesn't feel well to me. It feels like my intelligence is not being respected. He didn't even know he was doing that. It's just, yes. he's, you know, he's pretty high up in his position. He's always been in charge of projects. He's a project manager and it's his way to tell you what to do, but he yeah, did. Yeah. What he didn't realize is you get further when you ask. You get yeah. further when you. I call it the Oreo effect. Yeah. So I teach my clients. You know, the first cookie is compliment. Tell me what my strengths are. You know, encourage yeah. me. The cream yeah. in the middle is this is what I need from you. This is the yeah. thing that needs to be done. And the bottom cookie is 
I'm there for you. I support you. Let's do this. I believe in you. And if you yeah, can yeah. come at people that way, rather than just coming with the cream and saying, you need to do this and you need to do it my way and you need to do it on my timeline. And, you know, so there's a probably not going to work. <laughs> yes. So there's an, uh, an eloquence to manners. Give us an yeah. example of what you think uh, would be a good way of changing uh, one way to uh, the way that is more effective. Yeah. Um, and if I may, I'm going to add a very important point to the rocket analogy and children, because it's something that I think is so vitally important. And I wrote a couple chapters on this aspect, too. When a rocket launches and all through the phase of the launch, it's not like two people are sitting there at the controls flipping switches. In a NASA mission, there are thousands of people that make it successful. The astronauts just happen to embody the physical representation of what's going up. So analogous to rearing a child, you, you have to have a team. I talk about the importance of who is on your team. Right. Some of us naturally have teams. We have parents that help us out. We have friends. We hire caregivers. We do whatever we need to do. But I'm suggesting you need to embrace and develop and cultivate a team. And I have a particular model that I suggest in terms of how do you find people to do this? But some people feel like, well, if I, I just want to do it myself because it'll be done better because I can just get it done more quickly. Well, there's an elegance and a purpose to engaging uh, with a team of people to get anything accomplished. And like launching a rocket, it is not possible to do it by yourself. You have to have a lot of people. Um, so one of the distinctions, let's see, I want to make sure, I want to get back to, you asked me about a way of changing. So you, you brought up a, um, and, and redirect me if I didn't capture the question correctly. What I heard was if there's one way of doing things and how you can switch into something that perhaps is a little more authentic. Yeah, um, like like an example of what we see often, how people yes. communicate and then reframe it to your your manner yes. met, your manner method. Great opening. Thank you for that. I tell a story about a young man that I met in Atlanta, Georgia. I was flying in on a business trip and I take the car to the hotel and the young man was uh, greeted me at the door. He was in his uniform of the hotel and he was just obsequious. Oh, greeting, sir. I'm so happy to see you here. Welcome to the Marriott or wherever I was staying. And he was going on and on and on. How was your travel and everything? He, he was very polite, extremely nice and just, you know, on and on and on. But there was something that was bothering me, and I didn't quite figure it out until I got to the, he, he walked me in my bag, he insisted on taking my bag, even though I didn't really need help, I said, okay, fine, to the uh, desk to check in. And when he walked away, it suddenly dawned on me, I'm willing to bet that is not how that young man talks at home. Ah. He had an act. The act is called, and following his training, how to be nice to our customers. The challenge that I have is that I didn't get him. I got his act. Yes. I wanted him. Now, you can still be polite and mannerly without shoving your authentic self down in order to present a certain way. But people like me, can it's called cognitive dissonance in the psychology terms, right? Yep. I'm seeing one thing, but I'm feeling something else. Like, I'm not sure this brother's like this, right? Now, I have had encounters with people that I felt like they were so themselves and yet they were still respectful and manly. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, they had a bad day. But even if they did, they could have said, you know, hey, I'm glad you're here. You know, my day needs to get a lot better. Is there anything I can do to help you? I mean, I feel like that's – so I, I can't – there's not a formula that I can give. I wish I could figure it out, Maureen. But it's it's trying to pay attention to whether or not you know you are on stage 
versus who you are after the credits roll. Oh. I want I want that person. Yes. I oh. want that person after the credits roll. I don't want the actor doing a superb job. Now, I say this with a little bit of a caveat because my daughter is an actor. She's moved on to different fields, but I learned a lot from her. But I want the authentic person. I tell a story about this young man at a science fair. And when I, in my last job, I would go around the science fairs at NASA with hosts. And you know, I'd walk around and talk to the kids and everything. And inevitably, particularly for the 11, 12, and 13-year-olds, you know, they're shy. And, you know, they sit there and they look down and they mumble something about their projects. Some of them are more boisterous and all this kind of stuff. But I tell the story about, as I was approaching this one booth, this this kid, these two kids stood up before I even got there. And when I got there, the kid reached out with his hand and said, welcome, Mr. James. Thank you very much for coming to my booth. And I'm like, I never even introduced my name. I mean, he saw my name tag, but so did the 20 other kids who saw my name tag and they didn't even call me by my name. And none of the other kids stood up and he looked at me right in my eyes and he said, thank you very much for coming to my booth. I'd like to tell you about my science project. He had me. That kid, his name was Gabriel. He had me from day one. And at some point during the communication, he was talking about his science. He stopped talking. And he said, do you have any questions? And I said, no, man, keep going. And so he kept (laughs) going. And then at the end, he said, now, is there anything you see that maybe you can help us improve with our project or how we're speaking about it? I mean, he asked for my advice. No kid ever done that. And finally, I said, kid, how old are you? And he says, I'm 12, sir. And I'm like, oh, that's too bad. If you were 16, I'd hire you tomorrow. And I said, are your parents here? And he goes, yes, sir. They're standing right over there. And I saw them standing over in the corner and they were looking at their kid beaming. And I walked over to them and I said, I have no idea what you did to that kid, but he is amazing. I'd hire him tomorrow if I could. You have done a great job with Gabriel. And they thanked me. And then I parted ways. That's what I want. I want that authentic self. The kid was authentic. I I don't care what skills he had, technical skills he had or didn't have. I could teach him that because I knew he would be responsible to say, you know, I don't understand how to do Excel spreadsheets. How could I learn how to do this? What did I need to do in order to practice this? Or I can do this. In other words, they're straight with you, right? How many times have you seen people that can pretend they know how to do things and they actually don't really know how to do things, right? Because they're trying to do something or get one over on you. So that's an example to me of a kid that just blew me away with his presence. As contrasted with later in life, I was going to the airport and my wife and I found one of those pink neck pillows that you put on your head. And it was lying on the ground as I was walking to the terminal. And I thought, oh, it must have fallen off someone's bag. So I picked it up with the goal of finding out where the lost and found was. And the person at the airline uh, gate, the, the desk, the check-in desk said, oh, well, there's an information booth. Uh, down there, just take it to that person and they'll they'll put it in lost and found. I walk over there and as I'm walking, getting closer, I notice there's a young man and he has earbuds in. He has the kind that not like I'm wearing, but the kind that has a string that goes down into something and his head was staring down and he never looked up until I got right up to the desk and I kind of cleared my throat and he looked up and I said something about, you know, I was told to bring you know, this for lost and found. He still had his earbuds in and I can tell he was looking at his phone playing something and he took one earbud off. He looked at me like, what did you say? And I repeated my question and then he put his earbud in and he said, thanks. And he took the pillow and he went back to his his game or whatever he was doing. Yeah. I think he was about 17 years old. That kid flunked his interview with me. Gabriel did not flunk his interview. Gabriel, I would have given a job in a heartbeat. That kid in the airport, I would never give him a job because he was so enamored with what was on his phone. He didn't have the decency to at least acknowledge my presence and to accept it in a way that would make me feel like I want to hire this kid. And there's a lot he could have done. He had no idea who I was. 
He could ask me, oh, where are you going today? Oh, I'm going to Hawaii, which was true. He goes, oh, that's really great. What do you do? Oh, I work for NASA. Wow, you work for NASA? That's really cool. I mean, he could have acted interested. Even if he wasn't that interested, he could have acted a little bit interested. Yes. And then he would have, then he would have gotten me with his authenticity, his excitement about something. And, you know, and I probably would have given him my business card and said, well, hey, kid, if you ever need any support or help, let me know. He had no idea who was talking to. That's why I say you're always interviewing. You don't know who you're going to be with. You don't know who's going to be sitting next to the airplane with you. You don't know who you're going to bump into the grocery store. But don't shut a door to a future possibility that could be great because you decide that what's on this side of the door is more important than what could be on that side of the door. And you're going to act accordingly. So that's a distinction that I would make. Oh, oh man, I love all of that because I agree w so much with you. There are missed opportunities every single moment of your life. You think going to the grocery store, no big deal, right? My grandson and I are at the grocery store uh, yesterday or the day before, and there's you know one, uh, an older lady and she's in one of those um, electric carts. And yeah. And, um, I see her like just kind of looking and, and, and I, it doesn't take anything. And I said, is there anything I can help you get off the shelf? And she goes, Oh, I need one of those. And I go, Oh, great. You know, got it off. And I said, I'm going to be probably following, you know, around. I said, if you need anything, just let me know. And my grandson yeah, was great. standing there and my grandson was just like, it, he's always impressed because right. those those opportunities, just like you said, you're interviewing every day and you're not just interviewing for jobs, you're interviewing for humankind. And That's right. I, I think all those missed opportunities and uh, I hesitate to say this, but one of my relatives, because they're very, very introverted and very socially um, uh, phobic. And so uh -huh. I want to bring it up, but what a, a relative of mine cannot stand to have people look at her does not have any interaction the insecurities run so deep and i've had these conversations because i love this person and i'll say do you understand how much life you're missing because when you're gone you've missed out on all the fun yeah. and when you go out into the world just like you said gosh everything about that is what does it take to pay attention to others. We, you know, my husband, and I talk about Sonder, you know, we're so busy in our world. We're not looking at all those opportunities around us. When you start observing people around you, I love people watching. I, yeah, I love and, and you, that's right. And, and so I think the paying attention part is really important. It's not necessarily what someone says, right? Yeah. You have a dog, don't you, Maureen? I heard your dog, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Does your dog tell you, I have to go to the bathroom or I want to eat right now? Heck no. Does your dog tell you that? No, they don't speak. They do. You, you have a sense, right? A karmic sense. You know, they're spinning around or whatever the dogs do, but you kind of have a, it's kind of like that. It's yes. not kind of. Presence listening. I, I, you know, there's all these listening skills. There's hearing, listening, active listening. I call it presence listening, mm -hmm. where you are really present. And it's almost like giving confession to a priest, right? The priest is present there and really being with you. It's like, you know, if you lost someone that you dearly love, Marine, and you want to talk to your friend, your friend is just there for you. It's that kind of connection. And you can understand things about people without necessarily hearing words come out of their mouth right if you know some context about them and all that that might be helpful yes. I, I mean you talked about in introverted people i actually had an epiphany when i was at work particularly leading meetings that i had to start paying attention to the people on my team that were quiet the introverts because just because they were introverts doesn't mean they didn't have anything valuable to contribute so what i learned was i said I wouldn't just say, well, you need to learn how to speak up, Jill. I would ask Jill, I said, Jill, what are your thoughts about this? Even though I have 20 other people who are all extroverts who are raising their hand, they want to talk, talk, talk. So I would make a point of, of connecting with those people and ask them of their views. And they may put their head down and look and they might mumble something, but it's like, wow, that was genius. Well, that was really great, right? So, so as you're a leader and you're going to be a responsible human being with other people, Learn how to pay attention to all the cues, not just some of them. And don't necessarily assume that you know the whole story. As my mom used to say, you don't know people's history. I don't, I mean, I, 
I like I know I like you, Marina, already, but I don't know your history. I don't know what it was like for you to go through your other marriage. I don't know what it was like for you to rear your children. And so for me to make assumptions about, well, if you just did this, it would be really great. You know, my mama says, no, you don't know. Yeah. So, no, so have, a, have some empathy for people, you know, have empathy for people in what their journey was was all about. And um, And I think you'll end up doing a lot better. Yes, because no two life experiences are the same. So you can never go out into the world assuming you know what That's someone right. else feels. And even if they have a similar experience, it doesn't matter. You didn't have their parents. You didn't have you don't have their feelings. You don't have their personality. You don't have none of it. And I and I love what you said is the feeling part on people is you'll feel disingenuous people. You'll yes. know when that act is on. And I was in corporate for 27 years and I retired last December. And my job was to travel around and go to doctor's offices and hospitals and facilities and train them on how to uh, work with the insurance companies, how to code their laboratory work. Yeah. And I, there were days I'm not, not gonna lie I had to go on my friend at the time we used to laugh where you 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 drive to the facility you open the door and you flip the switch and you go in hi I'm Maureen from such and such and how's everything going and, blah, blah, blah. and the minute I leave that door that switch goes off I get back in my car and I'm like Ugh. <laughs> because I didn't love what I was doing and yeah, yeah. there's there's no faking it to you make it you can only do that for such a short amount of time when my clients come in front of me for life coaching I'm sure well they do love me but I'm sure I always say I'm not everybody's cup of tea but I go well with cookies because I'm a lot I'm a lot and I'm, I'm okay with that if you don't like it go find less but they know right. what they're getting when they've had a bad week or something's going on they know absolutely genuine come in front of me we're gonna get you back to a place of peace but you yeah. have to love what you're doing you have to love interacting you have to love right. wanting to be genuine and have those manners and have those connections if you just don't like the person i was talking about in my family they just don't they don't yeah. want they don't want yeah. that and yeah those you know and that's okay but it's a life unfulfilled i think because when yeah. you're, you're we're here to make connections and have relationships we're not here to be reclusive and live in caves so yeah. i think it's unfulfilling if we're not doing I agree. what you yeah. said that's very very well very well said you know i this i it's so funny because i've been retired from nasa for six and a half years i still act like i work there and i have to remember sometimes i mean i hand out nasa pins i wear my nasa flight jacket when i give talks and i have to remember i'm a private citizen but you know the nasa's in my blood and when i realized how much i love the space agency and what it represented and it was easy for me to be out there i i didn't i enjoyed that because a lot of people get turned on by it. It's a unifying thing. I mean, you see the NASA logo in all parts of the world and area, you know, in Ukraine and people are escaping the awfulness that's going on there wearing NASA shirts and all that stuff. They're not wearing, you know, Department of Transportation t-shirts or, you know, Veterans Administration, nothing against those organizations, but they're not, right? What is it about NASA that brings out the kid in all of us? Well, that's what I like, what I wanted to tap into to help be an agent for transformation for people to their true selves. And so I, I hear what you're saying. That, that's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So I always ask, as we wrap up here, we, we've got a couple of um, things. We've got some um, housekeeping things. I want to get all yeah. your, your information out there. But okay. I always ask, you know, you're marching in downtown Pleasanton, California, with 100,000 yeah. people behind you. And you've got a banner. And your banner is about the change you want to make in the world. What does your banner say? Uh, manners matter. Manners matter. Ooh, that's catchy. That's so catchy. Manners matter. Wow, changing two letters in each word. I love that. Manners matter. Man it does. Manners matter. So, where yeah. can we get this book? This wonderful book that I cannot wait to read. And <laughs> and where can we find you? Where can my listeners just reach out and comment and just touch base sure. with you? 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you for that. Um, I do have a website that has uh, my biography and background. It's simply my full name, Donald Gregory James. So donaldgregoryjames.com. Um, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. So if you Google around Donald Gregory James NASA, you'll find me somewhere. Uh, the book is in three formats, audio book, which I had the joy of reading myself. It's also ebook and paperback and Amazon, Barnes and independent bookstores. If you want to support your independent bookstore, I support that. You can order it through there. But DonaldGregoryJames.com is a website. And on the website, there is a contact section where if you want to email me, uh, but the email is not too hard to remember. It's manners will take you at gmail.com. <laughs> so yes. you just have to remember the title of the book. Manners will take you at gmail.com and you email me and I, I reply to all emails. And I, I, I appreciate that. that. Perfect. And I'll have all of your links up on your episode as well. So it'll be really easy for everyone to click on those links and get right to you and, and get that I book. I, I'm just excited for you. I'm proud of you. Um, it's just so amazing. So my last and final fun question that I always ask is what's your shameless self-indulgence? My shameless. Well, I should have, I should have told you that it would have, could have been Oreo cookies because <laughs> I cannot even be around. That's like cocaine to me. I mean, I just have to, it's like something about it is just addictive and I can take out a whole bag of cookies and I realize that sugar hits me and ruins me for days and weeks but um I I I mean I love to read and drink coffee I mean I, to me you know as a retiree it's easy to do because I have more of the time but um uh having a coffee and curl up with a good book is great um but on the on the more shameless side, I do confess that I get hooked into some Netflix series every now and then, and so I I I get caught into the, you know, and I keep saying, okay, I'm going to end it at this episode, and then they leave me hanging, and then like, oh no, okay, I'll just watch the first part of the next episode, and then pretty soon my wife is waking me up because I wait for the TV. So I admit. You're my kindred spirit. I mean, Netflix, <laughs> Oreos, books, and uh, coffee. I mean, I, yeah. that's that's all of my loves. I <laughs> I thank you so much. And if you want a good book to curl up with as well, I have two. My dog is yes. more enlightened than I am, and my dog is my relationship coach. I love it. And it's all about the dogs. I'm all about the dogs because thank you for the dog reference in our talk because I just think they know how to do life better than we do. I just, yeah. the unconditional way that they do self-care for themselves, the way they unconditionally love us and sense what we need without yeah. having to be told with, without using words is yeah. to me everything and that's um i live for the dogs and i have an e-commerce business now my dog is everything.net where we have healthy holistic treats for our dogs so through my own little wonderful i'm gonna tell our daughter she's got a new dog and i i think she'll love the book so i'm gonna definitely send it to her so oh wonderful great. well donald i cannot tell you what a wonderful time i have had with you today what a joy it is and i always say thank you for the hour of your life that you gifted me because time is very valuable and I cannot tell you how grateful I am for that and you're so fun and I just I loved this conversation I hope you had a good time oh uh, I I'm excited and ecstatic I did and and please do me a favor and and for your listeners to uh when you read the book I'd love to hear from you and just give me your reactions whatever they are what stood out, what resonates. Give me your stories. I love your people's manners stories. I collect them. So let me know. Who knows? They might end up in the sequel. Oh, 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 we got a sequel coming and reviews, guys. I, as an author and Donald as well, uh, we hate to have to go out there and solicit to get reviews. And it takes so little time to just say, hey, I got something out of this book. And those reviews really help us with book sales. And they, they really um, bring us up 
further on the SEO for um, making them visible so our yeah. stories can help each other. And yeah. that's what we're all doing. We're all, my banner says we're all saying the same thing. And it's that we just need to connect and be kind and love one another. And that's what makes our lives the most joyful. So that's right. thank you, my dear. You're welcome. You're welcome. Be well. <laughs>